even better. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so welcome to a new Accord seminar series, all virtual this year for the academic year 2020 to 2021. Um, this seminar series is all about sustainability, value, and cost. And today, um, Dr. Mark Greitz and I will be giving an introduction to our seminar series, talking about some terms and the overarching framework that we'll be using for the seminar series, which is thinking about value and cost from a multiple stakeholder perspective. So before we get into the content today, I'd like to read you this quote from, uh, it was published in 2015, but stated in 2014 by Enola Proctor and colleagues around this need for application and advancement of methods to improve sustainability. So we undertake a lot of work developing novel interventions, evidence-based interventions to address our critical health problems that uh, people in our society experience. However, we spend a little bit less time, but uh, more so these days, on thinking about the dissemination, implementation, and sustainability of those evidence-based practices. So for this seminar series, we'll be focusing on the science of sustainability. How do we develop, implement, disseminate interventions with evidence behind them that can actually be sustained within our health system in whatever context it is in which they're being implemented? So um, Dr. Proctor talked about how in spite of rapid advances in evidence-based medicine, we know very little about how well or under what conditions health innovations are sustained and their gains maintained once they are put into practice. Sustained delivery of evidence-based interventions is essential to public health impact, yet sustainability remains one of the least understood and most vexing issues for implementation research um, at the time, she argued largely due to unique methodological challenges, although well, certainly that's not the only challenge in studying sustainability. Um, I also wanted to bring your attention to the sustainability research landscape. So there are many different considerations in, in thinking about what we mean by sustainability science or sustainability research. Um, first, sort of in the middle there, you see there's a lot of disagreement um, in um, bringing together what we mean, how we define, and how we conceptualize sustainability, both from the perspective of research stages um, in terms of the of definitions and framework. There's also a lot of issues around measurement and analysis. Um, finally, um, not finally, but next, there's um, thinking about return and investment and adaptation. How do we ask research questions about how to adapt our evidence-based interventions to fit whatever context it is that they've been implemented in and sustained in? How do we communicate return on investment to those who have invested resources into the study of, of these evidence-based interventions? Um, uh, as we're working on today, uh, we're learning about training. Um, how do we prepare all of you to undertake and ask research questions related to sustainability? How do we think about organizational issues? How do we assess factors influencing sustainability? What are those determinants of sustainability? And then what's the environment? How do we characterize the environment or the, the context in which we're trying to sustain our different interventions? We'll address many of these in the seminar series. Um, so as I mentioned, our sustainability series is all about developing enduring healthcare interventions and specifically around research methods for evaluating and communicating sustainability, cost, and value of healthcare innovations from multiple stakeholder perspectives. Our learning objectives for the seminar series are that by, um, after participating, not just today, but over the series overall, defining the terms of sustainability, cost, and value, both conceptually and operationally, describing different levels of analysis and stakeholder perspectives on sustainability, cost, and value of healthcare innovations, and identifying methods appropriate for assessment of sustainability, cost, and value from these multiple stakeholder perspectives. When we say multiple stakeholder perspectives, we'll define that today, but we're really thinking not just about the individual patient or the healthcare provider, but the system um, overall, all of those different perspectives um, on who needs to be sustaining and ultimately paying for the delivery of these interventions. So when we say sustainability, we mean the continued use of program components 
at sufficient intensity for the sustained achievement of desirable program goals and population outcomes. That is, it's not just about whether it's been paid for, it's about whether we're continuing to do the evidence-based approach. And is it still working? Is it still achieving the outcomes, the benefits that were achieved in a more controlled research environment? Are you seeing those outcomes at the population level? By cost, we mean the time, money, and resources that are used to deliver services, that is the program components, or to make products. And then by value, we mean the relative comparison of benefits and costs from all relevant perspectives individually and in aggregate, including pecuniary and non-pecuniary benefits and costs. And Dr. Geitz will go into more detail on that. As I mentioned, one of the things to, that we consider in sustainability research is understanding, well, what are the factors that influence the degree to which a program can be sustained? That is the determinants of sustainability. This is in reference to correlates and predictors of sustainability, including organizational, contextual, and strategies for improving sustainability. We also think about the outcomes of sustainability um, or out sustainability outcomes in reference to the subsequent impact that is the healthcare improvement or public health outcomes of sustained use. We may also refer to this as sustainment. Um, so sustainability, to what extent can it be sustained? Does an intervention or program have the characteristics of something that can be sustained? And what are those characteristics? Um, and then sustainment is sort of the, the outcome. Is it, has it been sustained? Um, and again, emphasizing this multiple stakeholder perspective that both determinants and outcomes can be measured at the individual provider, patient, organizational, health system, or community level. And studies should specify the unit of analysis and provide a rationale for its choice. I also want to point out that um, the, our interventions, our programs are sustained within a system, and no one level can sufficiently describe the sustainability of an intervention by itself. You need to think about the complex interactions amongst all of these different perspectives. How do we maximize, how do we optimize sustainability across these different perspectives so that it's something patients want, that providers will deliver, that organizations will provide resources to sustain, that health systems can pay for, and that there's demand for at the community level. Is there a question? Will we get a copy of the slides? Yes, they will be posted on our CORDS website, All right? Um, so there is a really wonderful video series by Rachel Shelton, um, all about sustainability um, and so Russ wants us to return to the definition of um, in the subcomponents of the definition. We'll definitely do that. Um, so I'm not going to play this YouTube video for you. I just wanted to show you that um, Rachel Shelton does have this YouTube video series. Um, it's really excellent going into a lot more detail than I will today around how we conceptualize and measure sustainability. Um, so this is a great resource for you. Um, and we also reference it on the Accords DNI website. Not going to watch it. Okay. Um, so Jordan's going to bring up a poll for us here. And my question is, is sustainability really primarily or ultimately based on cost and what we can or are willing to pay for? Or is it based on motivation to participate in or deliver a service or your perceived benefit or value to you? What's that makeup? Is it really just when it comes down to it, it's about cost? Or is it really when it comes down to it, what's important to us? So Jordan, can I ask you to bring up the poll and we'll see what you all think. So having a little trouble launching this here. All right, just a moment. Technical difficulties. It's here, just not going in. 
Do I need to stop sharing? I don't think you need to. We can try that though. Okay, just a second. No, still nothing. All right. Do I need to? Oh, maybe I need to launch polling. All right. How about now? I can see it now. Great. All right. Fifty six percent votes are in. Hopefully we have no voting controversies. All right. Let's try to get a few more votes in there. 78% voted. Excellent turnout. Last chance. Make your voice known, okay? All right, I'm gonna end it there. All right. Can you all see the poll results now? Yes, it says attendees are now viewing the poll results. Great, all right, so um, nobody said it's entirely a function of cost and revenue. So Adam Smith is not in the audience here. Um, a number of you did say it's mostly a function of cost and revenue, see about 15%. Um, the winner is equally a function of cost revenue and a function of motivation. Um, about a quarter of you saying mostly a function of motivation. And um, one person saying, you know, when it comes down to it, it's entirely a function of motivation to deliver a service. Wonderful. All right. So I'm going to share my screen again. All right. So we are hearing that um, sustainability and value um, all, from the vast majority of you are saying that um, motivation really is an important aspect of it, your perceived benefit or value. Um, so what is it that we will spend our time doing? What is it that providers and health systems will invest their resources into? How do we know what that value is? Now, it is still important to know what are the cost or cost and resource requirements. We might be all highly motivated to live on a spaceship and go to Mars, um, but how many of us actually have the, the, the resources to be able to do that? And so we do still need to know what is this going to cost us? And so because of that, um, we are increasingly encouraging a collaboration between those who are experts in economic evaluation and those who are experts in implementation science. And so Mark and I are here today representing those perspectives. Um, and so we really need, do need to know what are the economics, the cost and resources required to implement evidence-based practices in real world community and clinical setting. That is, we need to know is it cost effective? Is there, is there a benefit and can we afford it? We need to also think about the economics of implementation strategies. What is the cost of change? So anytime we, try, um, we go into a practice, we go into a community setting and we say, all right, we're gonna mix things up and we're gonna do something different. Th there's a, a huge cost in terms of just the cognitive resources to thinking about doing your work in a different way. What is the cost of that change? How do we need to change our physical environment? Um, for instance, we um, in integrated behavioral health and primary care, one of the big things that we've learned is that you need to be able to facilitate face-to-face um, -face communication um, by close physical proximity among your primary care providers and your behavioral health providers. 
some of that has required redesigning the physical clinic space. It's also required redesigning our information technology and how we communicate with different providers across different um, um, physical settings as well as virtual settings. And so that ultimately the value of considering economic evaluation is that such research provides critical information for health system administrators, policymakers, payers, and provider organization leaders who ultimately make decisions about when and how to invest in evidence-based practices. Who is that decision maker? Is an important question you need to ask yourself as you embark upon studying sustainability, as you embark upon studying dissemination implementation. Whose job is it to make that decision and what do they care about? So in order to incorporate economic evaluation into implementation science and studying sustainability, we often are adapting traditional economic evaluation methods that include cost effectiveness, benefit cost analysis from a healthcare provider perspective with an expanded focus on different costs and outcomes from a health systems perspective. What personnel are needed, what space is needed, what training is needed, what education is needed, what quality improvement is needed, what practice facilitation is needed in order to implement change. How much time do we need to accommodate for learning something new, learning to deliver care in a different way? Um, so I liked this quote here that the aim of economic evaluation is to present evidence on the costs and consequences in terms of patient outcomes and Mark emphasized or benefits, he likes that term better, of quality improvement strategies and methods for increasing the uptake of evidence-based practices compared to the status quo. And in doing so, it informs whether specific initiatives are or have been a worthwhile or cost-effective use of the limited resources of health systems. <laughs> Just looking at chat periodically here. All right. So what types of things are we considering in economic evaluation and implementation science? We're really thinking about this implementation that is the rollout and scale up costs, training staff and new care delivery pathways, impacts of new processes on patient and caregiver costs, the cost of developing new processes, of delivering new interventions, as well as capital equipment and other materials and supplies. Um, we also need to think about different funding sources, who pays for these different things. And often the answer is less and less, it's paid for by grants. The practices in the health systems and the community settings are expected to pay for these things on their own. So what economic evaluation methods um, do we typically use in implementation science? Um, so from a methodology perspective, we're talking about cost effectiveness, cost utility, cost benefit, cost consequence analysis, as well as thinking about costs in terms of burden of disease to our society overall. And then the data sources um, for doing this economic evaluation are uh, still very much self-report um, or um, practices in, in community and clinical settings providing an indication of service inputs, out-of-pocket costs, also thinking about patient reported outcomes. Um, we also do a lot of observation in terms of the resource requirements. We map out the processes and we say what's involved in providing this service and making this change. Um, we often look to administrative and clinical data sources such as um, electronic health records as well as claims data. Um, so I strongly recommend this um, paper by Roberts on use of health economic evaluation and implementation and improvement science fields. Uh, it's a really nice systematic literature review. Um, and Amy's saying that she loves the explicit consideration about cost of change and its many facets, especially when there are limited resources and limited new things we can do. There's an there's a, a inherent prioritization that happens. Um, so we're not going to go into a ton of detail on societal um, perspectives on value, but I did want to raise this sort of interesting perspective that comes out of the UK and thinking about the National Health Service Sustainability, so the NHS. And so they're, they're saying that they, with the increasing demand on the health service, that the National Health Service, 
um, and an already large financial deficit, the major threat to health service sustainability is most often identified as financial. However, healthcare, as with all human activity, takes place within a social and environmental context and not just an economic one. Important social and environmental constraints exist along the well-publicized financial restrictions. And in order for the NHS to survive, it must be able to anticipate and respond to changes across all three spheres. And so I already talked a little bit about this sort of social context of, is this something that people want to do? What's the motivation? Um, is there perceived value? And what this perspective encourages is another consideration of environmental impacts in terms of the use of um, our, our tangible resources. Um, so for instance, so they defined value in this particular paper on the, the ratio of outcomes for patients and populations regarding um, with respect to the environmental, social, and financial impacts that they call the triple bottom line. And so they're specifically talking about carbon budgets. We need to be thinking about the environmental impact of the services that we provide. Um, so for instance, you know, I often think about um, how much plastic we use in the delivery of healthcare. Is that sustainability from, um, from an environmental perspective? And so what this paper goes into detail about is this notion of what are all the different um, natural resources that are required to deliver healthcare, thinking about gas, electricity, oil, coal for transport, um, construction, food and catering, the physical location in which we deliver care, um, the machines that we use to deliver care. Um, and so, like I said, we're not going to go into detail in this, but I thought I would highlight for you that there is this other aspect of cost that we don't typically talk about or think about in implementation science. Who pays, who profits, and who suffers, Russ asks. Um, so Mahesh has a question here about cost benefit analysis. I think I'll, um, maybe we can hold that question for later and we'll come back to it when, when uh, Mark gets into the cost benefit analysis. Okay. So I've mentioned a number, a number of times how our series will really focus on these multiple levels of analysis and perspectives. So first, the patient level and perspectives. What does it cost to me as the patient to seek out services? What am I paying out of cost? How much of my time is required? What resources are required um, for me to partake of this service program intervention? And the provider and staff level um, and, and their perspectives. What do they have to give of themselves? How much of their time, what resources, what training do they need to come to the table with? The practice on an organizational level and perspectives thinks about a lot more of those sort of physical and, and, um, and human resource types of perspectives, as well as what can we get reimbursed for? At the health system level, again, it's what are we um, what are we prioritizing within our health system? What are we going to invest in? What clinics are we going to set up? What's important to us? And are those sustainable from a financial perspective? Do we have the resources? Does the workforce exist to provide this service? Very often, um, at least in, in mental and behavioral health, which is the type of work I do, the answer often is not really. Um, we need to build up that workforce for behavioral health in, in terms of um, providing services within a clinical system. Um, and then the payer and purchaser level and perspectives, what are they willing to pay for? How are they generating revenue? What does our, our health policy system look like in this country um, for how we pay for health care? Um, government and policy level and perspectives is another important consideration. How do we set policy about how we will pay for health care and what we prioritize? And then again, as I mentioned, the societal level and perspective. What is the cost and benefit to us as a society overall? Are we good stewards of our natural resources? Are we good stewards of taxpayer money? Are we emphasizing health care and addressing health equity, health disparities, bringing health um, good health to all those that need it in an equitable way. 
Um, so we, we talked a lot about health equity in last year's seminar series. And so we, we um, highly recommend going back and looking at the archives on our health equity series, which again, followed a really similar multiple stakeholder perspective on health equity. Um, so that's all there if you'd like to go back and look at last year. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to Mark um, to dig into the details more on um, economic analysis considerations. So for that, I'm gonna give him remote control. Great, thank you, Bethany. I think I have, um, I'm just gonna to try to advance the slide here real quick just to see if I have remote control, yeah? Okay, I'm not sure I do, Bethany, but um, let's see what happens. Nope. Oh, there we go. <laughs> or did you do that? I think it's working now. Just took it a little while. Sorry about that. Well, thank you, Bethany, and uh, thanks for everyone for contributing to the chat. Um, I think I'll try to address some of the points that have been raised in the chat as we go through, um, but please don't hesitate to raise them back up as we have time for questions at the end. Um, so, you know, value takes on many, many different uh, definitions in, in healthcare. And generally, as Bethany pointed out earlier, we really think of value or economists think of value as the um, relative comparison of benefits, which can, is a very broad term that includes things like patient outcomes, as well as um, provider outcomes, health system outcomes, all of those different perspectives, as well as the cost to each of those multiple perspectives. You know, <clears throat> there are, as uh, Bethany just ran through, seven primary levels of perspectives that individuals think about, and we really need to be specific about what do we mean by benefits and costs um, from each of those perspectives. Now, the seminar series is not gonna be able to delve deeply into all seven of those perspectives. We'll be touching on uh, some, talking more about some more than others, in particular, the patient perspective, that provider and staff perspective, as I believe Amy Hubschman pointed out in the chat, you know, the fourth component of the quadruple aim really does uh, address that value or um, care experiences of providers and staff. And so that perspective really does pick up that's what we're looking at. So by providers and staff, we don't just mean the health system overall, right? That perspective is at a higher level. We also can think about perspectives at a practice level, which is, um, you know, can be a subset of a health system or most often is as we're thinking about, you know, health systems include, you know, hospitals, post-acute care facilities potentially, and so you really need to think about where is that really going to be uh, an intervention going to be implemented as we think about concepts of the benefits and costs from each of those perspectives. You know, when we're talking about benefits and costs, we really also need to explicitly account for, you know, both what are referred to as pecuniary and non-pecuniary benefits and costs. And the key distinction there is pecuniary benefits and costs are things that are naturally measured in dollar terms. So if you think about a payment for a particular healthcare service to a provider that comes in from a, you know, as a dollar amount, and so that's a pecuniary cost. If you think about non-pecuniary costs, quite often, you know, we'll think about opportunity costs this way, but it doesn't necessarily have to be limited to opportunity costs. So if you think about the 
time it takes for a patient to you know, travel from their home to a healthcare facility to receive a service versus potentially receiving it over a telehealth type of a platform, right? That's gonna involve costs of their time, which in its natural measurement is not pecuniary, but we can convert to dollar amounts um, using a variety of methods that we'll be talking about through, you know, particularly in that patient um, perspective seminar that will be coming up. There are also direct and indirect um, benefits and costs. Direct costs are those that are generally um, associated with the provision of a particular service. Um, there are also direct benefits to patients that are directly from a particular receipt of a particular intervention, and then there are indirect benefits and costs as well. So like an indirect cost would be a facility uh, component for the cost of delivering an intervention, and for patients it could be subsequent um, benefits that they receive, for example, of you know they're able to uh, continue working rather than taking time off to um, visit a healthcare facility. So, you know, both of those need to be considered as we're going through um, looking at value from all of those different perspectives. You know, opportunity costs, I've already talked about, that's often defined as, you know, the next highest value uh, for the use of a resource. And so in this time, case, things like time uh, of patients is quite often you, comes up in healthcare settings as a type of opportunity cost. And then finally, there are externalities that need to be taken into account. So that graph or visual that Bethany just showed from the NHS, you know, examples such as carbon impacts. Well, if we currently had prices that included those types of costs, uh, which currently are externalities. And so you need to be thinking about those, particularly from more of the societal perspectives. And then, you know, when we're looking at a specific analysis or a specific intervention, you know, trying to look at all seven of those perspectives often just isn't possible and we really want to focus on what perspectives are relevant to the type of analysis that we want to focus on. <clears throat> so the seminar series is really going to focus on um, sort of four different economic analyses. So one will be the implementation and program replication costs. Um, those will primarily be addressed as we're talking about the um, provider, staff, health practice, and health system perspectives, because they're generally the uh, entities that are implementing an intervention. And so that's really where we want to think about those implementation costs. We're also going to be talking about cost effectiveness analysis through the seminar series and cost utility analysis, which is a uh, type of cost effectiveness analysis. And one of the key things to keep in mind is when we say something is cost effective, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the result of a cost effectiveness analysis that has a very specific approach. And then we'll be talking about return on investment analysis and benefit cost analysis. And we can really think of return on investment analysis as a special case of benefit cost analyses. And we'll be talking about sort of that cost utility analysis and cost effectiveness when we talk about the patient perspective, because quite often, um, or particularly in cost utility analyses, patient reported outcomes are the key for conducting a cost utility analysis. And a return on investment analysis is 
uh, something that focuses on pecuniary benefits. So in terms of implementation or replication costs, you know, these, as Bethany mentioned earlier, taking on more and more significance within uh, dissemination and implementation studies. Um, but it's an analysis to calculate the cost of a specific intervention or program. And again, it usually comes from a provider or a clinic or a health system or a healthcare organization perspective as those are the entities that I mentioned are delivering the service or the intervention. Um, and really what the implementation program talks about is our implementation costs is it involves measuring the direct and the indirect costs of either an ongoing program as well, of an ongoing program as well as as its startup costs. And we really need to quantify and attach values to all of those inputs and resources used. When we're measuring implementation and replication costs, though, we want to make sure we don't include research related costs because those really wouldn't be incurred in a pragmatic, real world uh, implementation of the program once it's already been researched. And there are two general approaches to uh, this type of cost analysis. There's what's often referred to as macro or gross costing that really starts with uh, budgets and costs at a large organizational level and then tries to parse those out to different components. It's not easily adapted to specific healthcare interventions. And so we're going to be talking primarily about what are referred to as micro-costing approaches that use what are not, what's now referred to as time-driven activity-based costing. Historically, we used to refer to those as time and motion studies, where again, one of our seminar series will go in depth into that type of approach for doing implementation costing. If you're interested in learning more about it right away, uh, there's a seminal article by Kaplan that's identified here that you can look at. So as Bethany mentioned, implementation costs are almost always should be incorporated into considerations of sustainability. I think I noticed in the um, chat that uh, Jeanette Waxmonsky mentioned that you know, economic analysis or cost in response to the polling question is a necessary component but not sufficient for sustainability. And so it really is necessary if we're going to talk about sustainability of an intervention to consider the cost of delivering it. And there's, you know, a couple ways of doing a micro-costing approach. If the intervention is pretty well defined and limited in scale. You know, the best approach is using a time-driven activity-based costing approach. If it's a much larger intervention that involves multiple components of a healthcare system uh, and you wanna really try to capture all those, you can consider using, you know, key informant interviews. I realize that abbreviation wasn't spelled out. Um, or surveys, as well as administrative and electronic health record data. As we're going through the analyses, um, we wanna make sure we establish a specific aim involving the cost analyses and how that's gonna support the overall sustainability of the intervention. We have uh, put, through the, put together a resource hub for micro-costing methods. That's a, that was funded by the Data to Science to Patient Value Program, and the web link uh, will be on the slides that get disseminated. Just real briefly, if we're in talking about time-driven activity-based costing approaches, there are generally nine steps that are involved. Um, some of these can be collapsed 
and one of our seminars will go more in depth into this. But I uh, just wanted to kind of provide, I'm not going to read all the nine steps, but it will be available in the slides if you want to go through those. I know one of the pre previous questions through the chat I recall was, you know, can you use these types of methods when comparing different approaches? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, you just have to apply that micro-costing approach to each of the different interventions or approaches and comparing and calculate the cost for delivering each one of those. Uh, the second type of analysis that is broadly used in health economics is cost effectiveness analysis and its special case of cost utility analysis. And this is really comparing the incremental effectiveness of two or more alternatives. Uh, there's a real good summary by Neumann et al. that um, was published about four years ago. The reference is here. But an incremental cost effectiveness ratio really compares differences in cost between two uh, alternatives as w and compares that to the change in outcomes. And so when someone talks about cost effectiveness analyses, this is really what they're talking about is using incremental cost effectiveness ratio or an ICER. Um, and the primary difference between cost effectiveness analyses is that in a simple CEA, the outcome is measured as a health outcome directly with a health um, type of measure. And in cost utility analysis, the outcome is measured as quality adjusted life years, which depends upon patient reported outcomes. And so the seminar series will go into more depth about calculating quality adjusted life years. Uh, just to give you a real brief background on cost effectiveness analyses, it was developed as an alternative to benefit cost analyses. I believe someone mentioned in the chat that benefit cost analyses does require everything to be put into monetary units. Uh, quite often, this does become uh, a bit uh, concerning when you're talking about healthcare because that does require valuing if you want to look at a societal perspective, uh, you know, alter each individual's quality adjusted life years. And so they really adopted this approach. Costs are generally easily measured in pecuniary units, but benefits are often very difficult to measure in pecuniary benefits. And that's really where cost effectiveness analysis and cost utility analyses came from. These were generally developed taking a payer perspective, but more recently they've been um, taking on more of a societal perspective. As I mentioned, cost effectiveness analysis uses health outcomes. And I apologize if you hear noise in the background, my neighbor is having some yard work done. Um, some of the issues to consider in measuring costs for sustainability in a cost effectiveness analysis, or in general, are looking at related and unrelated direct medical costs. Uh, one of the particular issues related to cost effectiveness analysis is how long do you look out time frame from an intervention when you're looking at costs and modeling future costs beyond what is observed during the um, research project that's looking at outcomes? How do you discount those future costs? And do you include things such as non-medical costs? So, you know, for example, lost work time for patients could be considered a non-medical cost. And issues in measuring outcomes for sustainability, again, is how proximate are the outcomes that are relevant to the intervention and how do you model those future outcomes. As I mentioned, um, cost effectiveness analyses is beginning to take on more of a societal perspective. 
as well as a payer perspective. Uh, this graphic is uh, a recent example of an article that's tried to include um, sort of the, you know, in addition to quality adjusted light, life years and net costs, things like productivity of patients, you know, adhering, uh, adherence to treatments, uh, as well as equity and other types of issues, which start taking cost effectiveness more back into what cost benefit analyses were originally designed to do. And the, there's a reference there if you're interested in looking at that article. It's just one of many that has recently tried to take on more of a uh, societal perspective. Just real quick, a highlight, high level overview of return on investment analysis. Um, you know, it's a standard business model that compares benefits, in this case, financial returns, to the cost or investment for an intervention. It's almost always measured as a ratio of net benefits to costs. Uh, it is a very perspective specific analysis. So if you're gonna do a return on investment analysis, you really need to identify which perspective you're doing it from and measure the benefits and the costs from that perspective. It's particularly uh, important to do that for return on investment analysis because quite often a benefit from one perspective is a cost from another. So if you think about a payment from a, uh, for reimbursement to a provider, well, that's a benefit to that provider from that perspective, but if you're the payer, it's a cost to you by paying it out. So you really need to be careful about when you're thinking of return on investment analysis, of taking a very uh, perspective specific approach. It, it only includes pecuniary benefits and costs, depending upon which perspective you're looking at. And it is an essential analysis to inform financial sustainability not complete sustainability, but financial sustainability. Uh, some of the considerations in return on investment analysis are again, intervention and program costs, which uh, we can, will be delved into much deeper in the seminars. It does need to include startup and development costs. And then again, time frame and discounting. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the benefits and costs are very perspective specific. One thing you do not want to do is aggregate benefits and costs across perspectives for return on analyses. And um, you can do that in a benefit cost analysis, but should not be done with a return on investment. And then some of the issues, again, to consider are it's context specific terms of the ROI, um, inclusion of indirect benefits is a concern, and then there's the time frame and modeling of future benefits and discounting. If you want to see an example of a return on investment analysis for the diabetes prevention program, the state of Colorado did one uh, from a self-insured employer perspective. And there's a link to that particular website. Uh, benefit cost analyses, and I wanna wrap up here real quick. Originated as part of social welfare analyses, as I mentioned previously, it includes all benefits and costs measured in common monetary units. And it includes all perspectives and you can aggregate perspectives together. As I mentioned, it's not generally favored in healthcare because of placing monetary values on non-pecuniary benefits. However, my own perspective is it has fallen out of favor for that, but I think applying that approach, taking into account other types of considerations, like we've talked about motivation, non-quantified effects and equity concerns, really does help um, sort of place that type of analyses into context. And it really 
is an underutilized approach in healthcare as long as you don't take it as the be, in, be all end all of the economic analysis and sustainability. Um, so, you know, I think I'm gonna turn it back over to Bethany here real quick, but just from a an, an conceptual perspective value, it's very easy to conceptualize, right? It involves benefits and costs, but it's very challenging when it comes to how do you actually operationalize what you mean by benefits. Costs, a little less so, but there are still a number of uh, issues around operationalizing in pragmatic ways measurement of costs. So, uh, you know, our hope is through this seminar series, you begin to obtain a appreciation for all of these different issues that we've talked about today. So I'm going to turn it back over to Bethany and particularly as my ex outside noise starts getting worse here. All right, great. Um, and so a couple other concluding thoughts here and something that we wanted to raise is this idea that sustainability is really dynamic over time. And just because you know, today at this point in time, a particular health system or practice or provider says yes, we will do this, we will provide this service, we will continue to provide this program or this intervention, that might change. Can anyone think of a particular aspect of our context that has changed this year, that has changed um, what we are able to provide in our healthcare system? Yes, <laughs> COVID, massive changes, tons of dynamic sustainability happening this year and adapting to this new context. And so, so much of sustainability is contextually dependent. You know, go to Canada, go to the, you know, to the UK, go, you know, to global, other global health settings. How do they make decisions about what to pay for in their health system? It's entirely contextually dependent. It's a very different conversation. Uh, and we really need to be thinking about these health system and payment models. Um, there's an emerging, um, work on alternative payment models, bundled payments, um, and you know, you know, as um, as we see here, changes in reimbursement standards. Um, and so, so some of you can see all the comments. Some of them only I can, only the panelists can see. Uh, but tons of um, of impact of COVID this year um, on how we pay for things. And so reimbursement standards for virtual telemedicine models has really changed a lot this year. I think there's a lot to be seen about how that will continue to change um, as the world continues to change. And ultimately what we're saying is that, and there's a comment in here, you know, who determines the cost of an intervention? It's in the eye of the beholder. And we're, we're tailoring our assessment, we're tailoring our communications about cost and value to the decision makers in each of those different contexts. Whose job is it to decide? And what cost do they care about? What hits their bottom line? Um, so a couple things for our upcoming seminar series topics. And you know, we do have just a few minutes left, so um, feel free to put any questions in the, in the chat. And if you want everyone to see and be able to respond, make sure you pick the all panelists and attendees option within the chat. Um, so we will um, next month have um, Marcelo um, Perion from the Colorado School of Public Health come to talk about costs and value from a patient perspective, um, including patient reported outcomes, quality adjusted life years, and cost effectiveness analysis that Mark mentioned. Um, a provider and practice perspective from a distinguished guest, Dr. Doug Liu, coming to talk about program sustainability using survey measures. Um, so he'll talk about his program sustainability assessment tool that he's been involved in over the years. That should be great. Um, and then uh, Laura Panatoni, who I believe is from the, the Fred Hutchison um, Cancer Center, I believe, um, coming to talk about the health system's perspective on, on implementation costs, that time-driven activity-based costing and return on investment. Um, Richland Drew is also from the School of Public Health, coming to talk about the policy and societal perspective 
around benefit cost and cost effectiveness analysis. Um, and then um, Marsha Ori will be coming to talk about um, their falls prevention program as a really nice wrap up sustainability example. And then we have a few other queries out there um, looking at things like value proposition design and policymaker perspectives and, and preparing policy briefs to communicate value to policymakers. Because as we said, often it does come down to being able to communicate value to those setting policies and making decisions at the health system and policy level. Um, and um, also there were some questions in um, the survey that had gone around um, as we were asking people to sign up to attend today. And one of the questions was around, how do I get some help with this? And so uh, Mark's Accords Economic Analysis Corps provides consultations for free. Um, and so if you go to the Accords website, uh, I usually just Google Accords, the University of Colorado, and it comes up right away. Um, and there is a consult request form there. And so to submit a request for um, a consult with Mark, you ask, go to the general consult. Um, we also have some dissemination implementation science specific um, consults as well. And so if you're looking for more general dissemination implementation science, sustainability science um, types of consults, you can request support from one of our DNI scientists as well. As I mentioned, there's no cost for one-time consults for anyone. Um, we do look for people to be within the University of Colorado for those um, to prioritize. Um, and then you are also encouraged to include FTE for an economist as a co-investigator on your grant. So really thinking about that team science perspective, um, a health economist as a co-investigator, a dissemination implementation science as, um, as an investigator as well. Um, so thank you all so much for joining. Um, and yes, Amy's pointing out we have recorded this and it will be archived on our Accords Education website. Again, Google Accords Education, it should come up right away. Um, including all of our past um, Accords Education seminars that we've done. And um, for anyone who um, was not aware, we did put on a national conference this summer called CopperCon. And that is now archived and available for anyone to access as well. Um, let Jordan know if you need the website to access that. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Mark, for joining me. Thank you, Jordan, for coordinating. We appreciate everyone's attendance today. <laughs>